You're listening to the Biddy Tarot Podcast, and this is episode 18, How to Ask the Best Questions. Welcome to the Biddy Tarot Podcast, where you'll learn how to connect more deeply with your intuition and live an empowered and enlightened life with the tarot cards as your guide. Listen as Bridget and her guests share their very best tips and strategies to help you read tarot with confidence. And now, here's your host, Bridget Esselmont. Hello and welcome back to the Biddy Tarot Podcast. I am so happy that you have come back. We are getting such good feedback around the Biddy Tarot Podcast with some awesome reviews coming in. So I am so grateful to you all for listening, for being part of it, and for also sharing your really positive feedback. And it's my absolute honor and pleasure to be in your earbuds and in your ears talking about tarot. So big, big thank you and lots and lots of gratitude going out to you. So today we're talking about questions and how to ask the best questions of the tarot. Getting questions right is so crucially important because it means that we're getting the best information out of the tarot cards. Because if you approach the tarot with, you know, sort of a vague question or, you know, a question that's kind of a bit out of sync with what you really want, then your reading is not going to give you the quality that you really desire. But when we align our questions in tarot with our desires and what it is that we really want to manifest in life, then we get more out of the tarot reading. Now, I've already shared with you a little bit about how I see powerful questions happening in a previous podcast episode. So this time I wanted to invite a very special guest to share her ideas around how to ask the very best questions of the tarot. And my special guest is a book author, a party event organizer, a tarot teacher, and probably one of the most hippest modern people I know in the tarot space. She is none other than Sasha Graham. Now, Sasha has written books such as The Tarot Diva and 365 Days of Tarot Spreads. Plus, she has a new book coming out around tarot and magic in May, which I can't wait to see. She's also taught tarot at the Tarot School and just has a really beautiful down-to-earth and grounded way of connecting with tarot and working with her clients. So without further ado, I want to welcome on Sasha. So welcome, Sasha. It is so good to have you here on the Video Tarot Podcast. How are you going? Oh, I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. You are probably like one of the most like modern, hip people in tarot that I know. And you know, having seen like your one of your earlier books, Tarot Diva, I was like, oh, yes, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm super thrilled to have you on, on our podcast today. Oh, thanks. Um, thanks. So like, tell me a little bit, like, how did you get into tarot in the first place? Or like, how did you find tarot or how did tarot find you? I think tarot found me. Now I was, I'm a Halloween baby. I was born on Halloween. So I was born with, like, I always had this idea that marked me as somehow being special and having special powers, being a witch. And that, that included actually the, the first way that I sort of really experienced that was through the tarot, I felt it was my birthright to, to read the cards. And so I was about 12 years old when I got my first deck and I opened it up and I was all excited and ready to read them. And, and when I pulled them out, I discovered I couldn't read them. <laughs> and I was totally befuddled by, by the images and the meanings and the little white book. And I was, you know, I, it, it was a very humbling experience. And I think part of the reason that I wrote Tarot Diva was once I understood how to read the cards, I wanted to show people in, you know, an easy, easy, simple way how they can read the cards, how it, it's, it's not as overwhelming and confusing as it looks. So, so yeah, so, so, so that was it. So I, I was self-taught. 
until I went professional. And then once I started reading professionally, I went to the tarot school here in Manhattan. Wonderful. And like how, how has sort of tarot played a role in your life like since, you know, those early days up until now? Oh, oh my God. It's, you know, honestly, I, I sit here, I can't imagine, I can't imagine my life without the tarot. At first it was just fun you know, and fascinating. And then it became a way for me to help figure my friends' problems out and help figure myself out. And, you know, then it became a profession. And in the beginning, you know, it was just reading. I, all I did was read the cards for, for people here in the city. And then I began taking it, you know, into places I never expected that I would be writing books about it, creating events around it. I didn't realize that there was an entire tarot community out there. And now ultimately, you know, I really look at the cards that they're constantly kind of setting the bar for me personally. I look at the cards as really sort of a reflection of your psyche. So I'm always using them to help me, to help provoke me to better places, if that makes sense. So I I can't imagine, it's funny you should even ask that question because I had just flipped a card, I think this morning, and I was thinking, my God, what would my life have been without tarot? Because it's where I you know, it's really where I challenge myself every morning. You know, it's become, I, I pulled a card a day, at least a card a day for over 10 years now. Um, so I can't imagine my life without it. Yeah, interesting. And the, the question that's popping into my mind is, how do you maintain a healthy level of detachment with the tarot? And, and what I mean by this is, I think sometimes, you know, we can do daily card draws. And if we go down one path, we can end up forming almost like a dependency on the cards. Like, oh, I've got to, I can't make this decision until I've, you know, consulted the cards or I can't possibly move forward in my day until I've looked at tarot. Uh, (laughs) But clearly you're using it in a more constructive way. I'm just curious, like, how do you maintain that healthy relationship with tarot? I I think if I'm understanding your question correctly, I mean, I think that, you know, I don't look at the cards as giving me an answer. I, you know, I won't say what should I make for dinner, flip a card and go, ah, queen of pentacles says chicken. (laughs) When I, when I flip a card, when I ask a question, what I'm looking at is that kind of the card reflecting a part of myself. So, you know, if I'm flipping the empress in regards to a question I have, you know, she's begging me to take a look at how creative I can be about the situation as just a simple example. And the idea of myself and creativity, that's kind of infinite, right? So rather than being sort of a quick answer or something that would bring me into a dead end, it kind of provokes me to go even further and think about, you know, think about ways in which I could be creative that I haven't thought of. And then also, because I write a lot about the tarot, and because I kind of put it, I look at all of the events in my life and the world around me kind of through that lens. I'm constantly trying to push it forward and see how I can understand the cards and myself in a different way. And because tarot is repetitive and the nature of life is repetitive, the more I ask, hopefully like the deeper I go or the further out I expand like a balloon, if that makes sense. So it feels tarot is something to me that feels very pliable and almost, you know, like clay. So, which isn't to say that I don't get stuck sometimes like with the nine of cups. Sometimes I get stuck with him. Your wish will come true. I was working with him the other day, so that's so funny. But yeah, yeah, I think it's a it's a pliable art, and and so you know, I just keep pushing myself forward with it. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit, and mm-hmm. I'd love to hear more about like how you form questions for the tarot, and you know, like how do you ask the right questions of the tarot? Right, I, I think that you know. The formation of a really good question is so, is so super essential, right? Because it's like the first thing that, that you ask, whether you're reading the cards for yourself or whether you're reading for a client, you know, it's always that first thing, like, you know, what do I want? What is it that, and, and I think that oftentimes, especially if you're someone who works with your friends or if you work with clients in the cards, and I would assume that a lot of your listeners do, because of course, reading for others is one of the best ways to get to know tarot you know, oftentimes the formation of a question can be so incredibly helpful because a lot of times your friends or your clients don't 
really know what it is that they want, or they have this idea in their head of something they want. Maybe it has to do with a romantic relationship or with their life path, but because it's been in their head, because they haven't maybe articulated it, then, then, you know, coming up with the question can become half the reading. And sometimes just helping the person realize or articulate what it is that they actually want becomes really super helpful. And that's happened for me a lot with my clients in the past. But I think that that forming really good questions is so essential, whether you use tarot or not. And I don't think I don't think you necessarily even have to use cards when it comes to asking good questions. Of course, we're lucky because we have the tarot to ask. You know, I think it's a it's an incredible human facility that we have the ability to dream and to imagine something. So when you have a vision in your mind, a desire or something that you want, you know, after you experience that, the first thing that you'll ask yourself is, okay, well, how do I make that happen? How do I do that? How do I get that? I want that. How, how can I make it mine? So, so once you know what it is that you want, you know, I think the formulation of a good question will trick your mind into finding the answer. So yeah, so when it comes to like achieving a goal or manifesting a desire, I think that the power really does lay in the question and not in the answer. So yeah, I think, you know, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. (laughs) No, no. But I'm just thinking, yes, yes, yes. Because I, you know, I think getting like landing on that right question is, is almost a process, a healing process within itself, right? Yeah. Because it's the nature of asking that particular question that will seed the mind to start thinking about, yeah, what the answer would be. Exactly. Exactly. And, and it's, this is the interesting thing about what happens with questioning that like our minds are, are created so that once we answer that question, you know, we leapfrog on to the next one because it's our, it's our human nature. It's it's like, you know, you sit around and think, oh, what am I going to have for lunch? And the minute you decide and decide and have that, you're like on to the next thing, right? So if you're asking a really, really good question about how can I set myself up for success, once you do that, boom, you're leapfrogged on to the next. Okay, well, how do I spend the money that I've now, you know, created with my good success? So if your brain is given good questions, then you're going to be moving forward in a really proactive, smart way that moves you quicker in the direction that you want to go. And that's why I think that we can use tarot to help us come up with good questions so that we're always sort of moving further faster. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And so like how how can we help either ourselves or our clients get to that point that we are asking, you know, a, an appropriate or a constructive kind of question? How can we get to that place? Okay. Well, I I think it's always best first to take a look at what you don't want to do or questions that you don't want to ask, right? So what's an example of of a negative or maybe even a toxic question. And I think that those questions tend to begin with either why or when, right? So questions like, when am I going to fall in love? Why am I such an idiot? Like, why, why am I so unlucky? Like, why is this happening to me? Why am I eating this fourth slice of pizza? Like, I think that these, these questions aren't only poorly constructed, but I think they're just, they're just destructive because they cave in on your brain. When you ask, whether you ask a tarot card or anyone why or when, it doesn't give your brain any room to explore or discover a satisfying answer that sets you on a new course. Because why or when, even if you find out, well, you know, this is why you're so unlucky. What are you going to do about that? You know, and, and if you ask a call, when am I going to fall in love? Well, you know, Friday, you know, September 9th, what are you going to do? Just sit home and wait until that. It doesn't, it doesn't give you anything to do with it, but a good question begins with, with uh, what or how, right? A good question acknowledges the personal power that you have over your future. And then they put your brain in the driver's seat, right? So they give your brain something it can do. So you could say, instead of when am I going to fall in love? You could ask, what can I do to cultivate an amazing romantic relationship? What can I do? So immediately your brain is thinking, what can I do? What should I do? How, what can I do differently? You know, how can I attack this issue in a different way? How can I have more fun in my life? 
what fulfills me? And, and these questions, the, the how and the what questions, you know, you could spend your life really enjoying yourself, finding the answer to what fulfills me. What am I passionate about? You know, why, what is it I'm here to do? And, and these, these are questions that they'll trick your brain into proactivity. And when you're asking them of tarot, you're going to get back a very specific answer that then you can go and like make magic with. Hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. 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 And I, I think, you know, it's, it's even going beyond like just choosing a question that's appropriate for a tarot reading. It's, as you say, it's like to trick your brain and it's almost to trigger that next step and, and that action. And again, so that just the process of asking the right question pushes you forward a step. And then the tarot mm -hmm. adds the next step in terms of giving you even deeper insight. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. And it's good. And I, and I think it really, it really works. Like I love the idea of creating really good power questions for yourself. And a power question, in my opinion, is, is something that like tackles a really sort of big issue or a big goal or a big desire that you have. And, you know, I think if you ask it every single day, I think it, you know, a lot of people will pull a tarot card every day. So if you ask, if you're really stumped on something, you know, and I, and I know this because it happened for me before I, I became a professional reader. I didn't, you know, I spent about a year knowing that I was going to make a career change and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I asked every day, I didn't ask the tarot. I, I, I kind of just looked up every morning and went, what, what am I supposed to do? What, you know, what, what's my next step? And one day it hit me. It really hit me after like a good six months to 12 months of asking, but it was the right answer. And yeah. And I think that I just, I think that since people are usually using their cards on a daily basis, you know, it's, it's worth it to construct a really powerful question that because that you'll find the answer to that can have with the power to change your life or at the very least improve it. Yeah. And so like with a, with a daily power question, what, like, is there something general that you would recommend or is it that each individual should come up with what their one thing is that, you know, they most need to know? Well, I think that, I think that there's three things that anyone can do when you're constructing a really good power question or just a regular question. And this is something you might want to keep in mind when you're, you know, if, if any of your listeners are working with clients and it can be something that can really be beneficial to the people who come to you. So the three things that you would do to construct a power question are one, acknowledge the role that you play in your future. You know, it's not 1492. We all know that we have a great deal of effect over our future. Our, our destinies are not written in the stars. So inside of your question, acknowledge how much power you have in your life because we all do. We're all so powerful, right? Number two, state your desired outcome. And sometimes you won't know necessarily what that is. You know, some people are very, very specific. Oh, I want to make $2 million a year. Oh, I want to move to California. Or, you know, I want to be married with a baby within three years time. And if you know what it is, that's great. State it, put it inside your question. But if you don't know what your desired outcome is, you know, state the qualities. A lot of people come to me because they're unhappy with their current job, but they don't know what they're supposed to do, you know, what their, their ultimate career path might be. And I always say, well, what is it that you want? What are the qualities that you want? You know, so start to describe, even if you don't know specifically what your desired outcome is, describe how it feels, because we all know what we want to be feeling. Mm -hmm. And then three, construct chips, put those two together, acknowledging the role you play in your future, stating what you want. And then create the question. And then, in my opinion, just ask that question every single day until you get your answer. And I promise you, you will. If you, if you are diligent and ask it every day, you'll get your answer. And if you ask it with the tarot, I think you'll get it a lot faster, mm. you know, because then the, the images and the cards will really point you in the right direction. Yeah, I, I love how it's focused on what is it that you truly desire? Like, what, what do you want? Because I think that's showing... Well, in my opinion, it's showing tarot in its most powerful use, which is to manifest your goals and dreams Yes. versus to tell you what's going to happen. Because when you use it for more like prediction and this will happen, then it's taking your power away. But when we look at it from the perspective of 
how do you manifest what you really want? Then, oh, that's the exciting part for me. (laughs) And it must be for you too. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And, you know, it's it's a funny thing too, because, you know, and I'm very, you know, I I don't read predictively and I don't even, what do you do? So the future is always going to sort of be out there in the future. The best thing it can do, I think, when you're predicting future with your future with the cards is kind of maybe make you relax a little bit. You know, I, I think being in creation mode always as a human being is just so much more powerful and more exciting. Because at that point, if you're just sitting back and waiting for some predicted outcome to happen, you might as well be like watching the Kardashians on TV or something, which isn't to say that that's not super fun, but yeah, you know what I mean? You have to be active in your life. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, that's certainly where I like to play. I like to be to be thinking, okay, what is it that I want and what can I do right now to go and make that happen versus, oh, this is going to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then it's just like, blah. <laughs> you know, it's so passive, isn't it? I, I much prefer an active approach to life and, and you know, I think certainly many people do. So using the tarot in that way is an awesome, an awesome use of, of this tool. Yeah. I'm curious, like whenever we talk about questions in tarot, the topic of rephrasing people's questions often comes up. So Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know, like, what's your approach if, like, let's say you had a client sitting in front of you and your client says, right, I want a husband. When am I going to husband? When am I going to fall pregnant? And what's the first letter of my husband's name? So like, you know, (laughs) I've set that scenario up for you. (laughs) What do you do now? (laughs) Okay. So with my, with my reading clients, I always have a pre-interview with them before I actually do a reading to make sure that we're a perfect fit. And I explain to them how I read and they tell me what it is that they're looking for. I don't do predictive readings. So I, so I don't, I would never be put in that situation where someone was like, tell me my husband's the, his, the letter of his first name. Just because at that point, if somebody wanted that kind of specific predictive information, I would say, I'm not the reader for you. Yeah. But there's plenty of other readers out there who would probably be more than happy to give that information to you. But oftentimes, or if you're at a party, and I've certainly been at parties where I can't interview the people that are in line for five minute readings at a Halloween party. When somebody sits down, you know, a great example is I'll help them. I'll, I'll tell them I can't answer a question like that, or it's not within my ethics to answer a question like that. And most, most of the time I have to rephrase when it comes down to mother child questions, you know, you'll get a client that has, you know, maybe a daughter who's in her first year of college and she'll be telling me what's going on. (laughs) I want to know what my daughter's up to. And, you know, I, I feel like when you're reading tarot, it is unethical to peer into someone's life. So I will always help them rephrase their question and say, you know, this isn't appropriate for the way that I read, but why don't we pull some cards and see how you can best support your daughter right now? How can you be the best parent, the best coach? How can you best show up for this person in your life that you love, who you like information on? What can you do to be their best sort of power support or or source of, of power and love? And so I always will reframe the question sort of and put it the onus back on the person who's come to the reading rather than prying into somebody else's life, Yeah, if that yeah. makes sense. Absolutely. Actually, let me, th- let me throw you another scenario and I, I'm, I'm curious again to see how you might respond. And I'm glad we touched on the third parties because that's, yeah, that's a topic that often comes up in discussion too. But let's say someone walks in, they say, right, my question is, why am I so depressed? Mm. What might you do in that situation? Oh, that's a great question. Why am I so depressed? Well, what I would start doing, honestly, I would feel, I would start to talk. I would start to talk. I would start to psychoanalyze and and talk to them and start asking them questions before I even flipped any cards. I would find out as much information as I could. And I would say, you know, why do you feel like you're depressed? What is your greatest source of angst? X, Y, Z. And so I would start feeling them out in that way before I pulled cards, if somebody came to me and said, you know, they were incredibly depressed, then I, I would, and they didn't, they didn't want to say anything else to me. Although I don't think that's ever been the case. I would say, so let's pull some cards and I would, no, I would probably do a Celtic cross spread to get sort of a holistic idea of where they were 
in general, because the Celtic cross, you know, gives you a little bit, little taste of everything. It's like a snapshot of a life. And then I would most definitely pull a card to give them a focus. I would pull a focus card. Because here's the thing. I think that most people walk out of readings remembering maybe only two or three things you say, even if it is a 60 minute reading, there's just too much information coming at you. So yeah, I think people tend to walk away with just a few things that they hold on to. So knowing that, I always try and give my clients something they can walk away with. And it's so easy now because somebody can pull up a card and they can use it as a screensaver or put it on their phone. So especially if somebody was depressed and were looking for a source of light, I I would give them, I would pull a card and say, this is what you can focus on because you can find something wonderful to focus on in any card. And then hopefully it would help, you know, maybe give them a direction to move towards healing. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. And I'm going to throw one more last scenario at you. Only, only because these are like questions that I know come up a lot. So let's say if someone sat down with you and they just shared all their life story or like, you know, all the details about a particular issue or what have you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're sitting there, you're listening, like, where's the question? Where is the question? And all you're getting is like, you know, yeah, the problem. So like, what would you do in that situation? How do you start to get to a place where you've got something to work with? (laughs) You mean when somebody's just sort of like, blah, 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 blah. And they're just like telling me about everything in the kitchen sink. Yeah. And you're like, what's, what do you want to know? (laughs) Well, you know, I, I always take my cues from the client and for some people, they, they do just want to talk about whatever it is that they want to talk about. So I, I would wait until I, I think that they, they felt like they had expressed themselves in a way that made sense as long as time wasn't running out. And I would say, you know, I would sort of su- subtly say, well, you know, what's your challenge? What's your issue? What is your issue? What do you want to look like? Or should we just start pulling some cards and see what they say? I think if you're ever in a crux and you don't know what to say. You can lean on those cards, man. They are like your best crutch ever. So you'll just say, well, let's pull some cards. Let's see what the cards say. Even if a person hasn't asked you a question, at least so you can feel like you've given them something. But, you know, sometimes people just want to talk. So you have to take your cue from them. And if somebody came in for an hour reading and they talked for 55 minutes, I'd still just pull a a card for them to walk away with. So they would have something to walk out, walk out the door with. Yeah. So what I'm noticing like in your approach is not necessarily being so rigid that you insist you must have a question and it must be the perfectly worded question. Oh yeah. (laughs) But more about being quite organic in that process and allowing the dynamics to eventually lead you to sort of that power question. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to happen straight away, right? And, you know, sometimes, and this is interesting, and since you were giving me scenarios, I'm going to put a scenario out there, which always kind of floors me when it happens. And I think it's really interesting when people ask a reader something that's kind of like horrible. Like I had a man at a party once, look at me square in the face. He was gorgeous too. <laughs> and he was, he was like, can I get away with cheating on my wife? Oh, Yeah. And I was like, wow. And, you know, you have to make your ethical decisions for yourself. But, you know, as a tarot reader, it's not my job to judge someone. And so I try not to make, I try not to make judgment calls. If, you know, you can get into some interesting gray areas sometimes. There can be legal gray areas. There can be, you know, romantic and ethical things. And in those cases, you know, depending on what it is, I let the cards speak for themselves. And I, I try and step aside as much as I can anyway, because as a reader, you don't always necessarily know the full story anyway. Mm. But I, I, I think that's, I think that's interesting when unethical questions get brought up in surprising ways, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I you know, in, in saying that it's so important to sort of leave your judgments at the door and your opinions at the door, because you, like you said, you just, you don't know what the situation is. Like, let's say in that situation, he may already know that maybe his wife is cheating on him and he, now he's trying to work out whether it's payback time. <laughs> right. I mean, I don't think that was the case in this particular situation. <laughs> I think he was a right bastard, to be honest yes. with you. Yeah. But it's not, that's not, you know, that's not why 
you know, it's not my job to judge. And, and, and I also, you know, I think it's important that we don't sort of put our life perspective onto our clients because I know for myself, you know, I've had readings in the past where the reader could not, I could see that their vision of life was much different than mine. And I don't, I don't think it's fair for us to cast our life view on another person. And I think that might belittle their experience. So I try and stay as open and abstract as possible when the situation requires it. And I think that that is how we can become very helpful to people. Because like I said before, we just, we never really do know what the whole situation is. So yeah. 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 Excellent. And, and I think that's also important for people like when they're learning to read tarot, sometimes they can tend to become too rigid in like, well, it has to meet these certain criteria. The question must be a what or a how question, and it mustn't be about a third party and it must be ethical. And, and you know, they're doing that because that's a safe way of, of approaching a question. But I think mm-hmm. you know, as experience grows, it does become a little bit more fluid and a bit more organic. So I think it's been really interesting to hear how you work with questions, knowing that there's a great way of asking questions, Mm -hmm. but also then being flexible around not forcing a client into having to ask that specific fabulous question that, that there is a bit more dynamic going around, if that makes sense. It definitely, definitely. And, and, you know, and I feel like the power question thing, you know, it's good for you. It's good for you. But, you know, the tarot is a very, you know, like I said before, it's a pliable tool. You know, it's, it's very structured, but at the same time, it's also very infinite. You know, it's, it's made up exactly, you know, like our bodies, right? Like our Mm -hmm. lives, like on the outside, you know, we're all pretty much built the same, two arms, two legs, one head, one brain, one heart, you know, but the way we make up all of that is extraordinary. And the same thing applies to tarot because, you know, tarot applies to us. (laughs) Yeah. So within that infinity, you get to color it however you like. Yeah. And so, yeah, so it becomes ever growing and ever expanding, hopefully like your practice. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of ever expanding, Miss Sasha, mm-hmm. I believe you've been expanding in positive ways. <laughs> because of a huge and been... I had for dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I believe that you've been writing a book over the last wee while. So I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. Oh, okay. I have, I do, I have a book coming out in May. And it's kind of a follow-up to my last book. My last book that I published with Llewellyn was 365 tarot spreads. And it gave the reader a tarot spread for every single day of the year. It was so much fun writing this book simply because, you know, I'll write books for the questions that I have. And oftentimes I would run out of questions. So it was really fun. I wanted to write a book so that at any point anyone could could open it up and ask their cards something, even if they felt like they didn't, if that like they were out of questions or like they didn't know what to ask, or maybe could find ways to find really good questions around a topic that they hadn't maybe thought of asking. So right when I was finishing that book up, I started thinking, okay, what's next? What's next? And I thought, my God, 365 tarot spells, a tarot spell for every single day of the year. How phenomenal would that be? One of my favorite books when I was really learning and delving into tarot was tarot spells. And, you know, it like magic tends to be, you know, I picked it up thinking I was going to cast a spell. I put it down learning so much about the cards because the tarot spells in that book were very experiential. And so that I knew at the very least, I could give the readers a way to enter at least one card every day of the year, and then like hopefully manifest all this fantastic stuff around it. So, so yeah, so that book's coming out in May and it's, it's exactly like the title states. It's a spell for every, every single day. Uh, It also includes meditations into the cards. So you really get inside the arcana and you work directly with the energy of the archetype. And as far as the magic that it contains, you can kind of embrace it as lightly or as intensely as your practice or your soul dictates. So if you just want to light a candle and work with a card, you can do it that way. Or if you want to light a candle, light incense, open sacred space, chant, 
have music, you know, you can do whatever it is that's in your comfort zone, but hopefully it'll give you a very marked, very guided way of, of achieving your hopes and your desires through the arcana. And I can tell you writing the book changed my life. It was like (laughs) writing a book of magic is, has a profound effect on your life. So yes, so I'm really excited. So that comes out in May. Wonderful. That sounds awesome. And like, apart from just being uber cool, I think it'd be great because it's, it's again, tapping into that manifestation energy of the tarot that we've been talking about today. Yeah. And you know, the power of like ritual and and magic for manifesting is pretty awesome. So, oh, and I, and I and I think, yeah, and I think that's what people are doing anyway. You know, I think that's what they do anyway. And this just gives you sort of a more formalized way, I suppose, to do it. But yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. And that's, yeah, like you say, it's tarot at its best. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, well, I can't wait to see a copy of it when it comes out. So, Sasha, thank you so much for today. It's been fascinating to hear how you know, you approach um, asking questions and, you know, not just in like your personal life, but also with your clients. So big thank you for sharing all of that knowledge today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's been my pleasure too. (laughs) So like, where can people find out more about you? Oh, they can go to my website, sashagram.com, or they could just Google, if they Googled like Sasha Tarot Diva, I would come up probably pretty quickly on Google. Yeah. But definitely my website, Sasha Tarot Diva. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm pretty much all over the place. Wonderful. And I've been seeing some really cool like tarot recipes coming out. Yes. From your website. That is the coolest idea. I love it. Yes, yes, yes. And I've and we've shot, my husband and I have shot a few of them. So you can also find me on YouTube, Sasha Graham Tarot Diva on YouTube. I've got some cool tarot recipes and yeah so you can find me there too and I think just reflecting I think that's what I enjoy most about how you interact with the tarot and it's you make tarot fun and you bring it into new spaces that's you know much you know like more integrated into daily life and I think that's yeah Mm. that's awesome and it's fun and and cool so I'm I'm really happy to see that happening (laughs) thank you (laughs) Well, it's been a great conversation and I really appreciate it. And I wish you amazing success with your new book. I'm sure it will come. And no doubt you've probably done a few tarot magic <laughs> spells to, to make it all happen. Oh. But yes, thank you very much. And we shall speak soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, if you loved today's episode, then please go on to iTunes and leave a review and remember to subscribe to get the latest podcasts. I'd be ever so grateful if you can share your thoughts, opinions, and feedback so that others will know if this podcast is a great fit for them as well. Thank you so much for listening and I can't wait to speak to you next time. Thanks and goodbye.